opportunity to encourage one another in this way. Scripture reading for our sermon today comes from Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. It says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was there with her, and he ate it. This morning, the title of our lesson is, I Choose to Sin. Does that shock you? Does that shock you that I would preach a sermon to you, the church, I choose to sin? Maybe it does. But there's not one person in this room that that doesn't apply to. Friends, we all choose to sin. We all make that choice. Now, before we get defensive, I want you to understand that we always have a choice. We always have a choice to sin or not. We decide whether we're going to make the right decision or we're going to make the wrong decision. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 that we are never tempted beyond what we can bear. Now get that. It doesn't say we, God will never give us more than we can bear. That's not what that says. It says we're never tempted beyond what we can bear. And when we are tempted, God will provide a way out. So that means I have a choice. I'm standing in a room. The door is locked. The window's open. If I went out of the room, what do I do? I choose to go out the window. Or I choose to stand there and take whatever the room's going to throw at me. So I choose. I make the choice. And choices are put before us every day, and we need to learn to make the right choice. Adam and Eve had a choice. Remember, they're, they're put in the garden. God created them, and he gave them all that they needed to survive in the garden. There was nothing they didn't have that they needed. God provided them. God gave them all. He gave them one command. Boy, wouldn't it be great if we just had one rule in life to follow? Wouldn't it be great? That's what Adam and Eve had in the garden. Genesis chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are to, <clears throat> excuse me, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Okay, here is the rules. You've got this beautiful garden. You've got all these trees you can eat from, but not that one in the middle. Because as soon as you do, as soon as you touch it, you are going to die. Now, you think that would be pretty good incentive, right? Stay away from it. I mean, there wasn't, you might. There wasn't, it could possibly happen. You are going to die. So why is it that when you're told you can't have something, you want it all the more? I mean, isn't that the way it is? Don't touch that hot stove. I mean, and it happens in restaurants all the time. The waitress or the waiter comes in, cuts it down, hot plate. What's the first thing you do? Really? (laughs) We told you it was hot. Don't touch it. See, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9 describes the trees in the garden. And they're pleasing to the eye. They're good for food. You got the one tree that's also pleasing to the eye. It's also good for food. But it has one thing the rest of them doesn't have. It'll give them wisdom. It'll give them wisdom but it also comes with a curse. You will surely die. It seems that Adam and Eve had no problem obeying God until some outside source, the serpent, came along. 
I mean, isn't that the way it is a lot of time in life? We have no problem being obedient to the rules until some outside force gets involved. I mean, maybe you, you recognize it in school, or if you're in school still, you do all right following the rules of the school until you've got a friend who wants to rebel. Until you've got somebody who doesn't want to follow the rules, and they convince you too. You see, pressure from others often leads us into sin. Now, let me explain that. It leads us into sin, but ultimately the decision is ours. There's always a choice, but yeah, it may not always be a good choice. There may not be an option that I think is great. I mean, you'll see it a lot of times when, when people are on trial for a crime they've committed or before they go to trial, they're given a choice. You, know, you can admit your guilt and serve a shorter sentence, or you can go to trial and possibly serve a longer sentence. Neither one of those options is really good. But you make a choice. Which one do I want to do? Remember the conversation, I'm not going to go into that, we all know it, the conversation between the serpent and Eve and how the serpent twisted the words of God. You see, that's how charismatic people convince otherwise wise people to do the wrong thing. They twist the words of the truth. They speak in half-truth. I mean, because it sounds good. Well, yeah, God did say that. But the serpent told Eve, you surely will not die. Well, that's not what God said. God said you would. But see, the one thing that God, or the one thing I think that pushed you over the edge, when the serpent said, God is just afraid that you'll become like him. I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes it's appealing to think, man, I would love to be that wise. But you know what happens when you become that wise? Where did it come from Spider-Man? With great power comes great responsibility. I don't want that responsibility. You know, my brother-in-law and I always used to joke that he knew half of everything in the world and I knew the other half. And it was pretty easy to get away with because if somebody asked you a question, you say, well, that's his half. But you think about that. If we have that much knowledge and that much wisdom, we're going to be expected to be wise all the time. And that's hard to do in this world. You know, Eve knew the right thing to do. Genesis 3.3, But God did say you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. And serpents said, not true. And so at that point, there's a choice to be made. Who do I believe? Who is right? Well, we know what happened. Eve chose to believe the serpent. Friends, the best thing we can do when we sin is say, yes, I've sinned. Yes, it's my fault. Yes, I am guilty. I make the choice whether I'm going to sin or not. It's me, myself, and I. Nobody else. That's the best thing we can do. Cain had a choice. Well, I guess we need to say the blame game started first. Eve didn't want to take responsibility. Adam didn't want to take responsibility. Genesis 3, 2, 3, 12, excuse me. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. First of, God, first of all, God, it's your fault. You gave me this woman. You laugh, but women are convincing. Women can influence you to do things you never dreamed you would do. 
How many of you guys ever thought you would hold a purse in the middle of a store? But you've all done it. You've all done it. But he said, God, that's your fault. You put her here. And it's her fault because she gave it to me. And now, there's a lot of discussion and argument in scholarly circles, but the Bible's pretty clear when you go back and look at the actual sin. It says, and her husband who was there with her. So it's not like he didn't know where it came from. And he ate it. And he ate it. The next verse. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent! The serpent deceived me, and I ate it. So it's not Eve's fault. It's not Adam's fault. It's God's fault and the serpent's fault. I see, God puts you in a garden gave you everything you need to live, gave you every tree to eat from except one, and it's his fault that you ate from the tree you was told not to. It's the serpent's fault because he deceived you. You knew the truth, you knew the rule, you knew what was right, yet he deceived you, friends. We fall into that trap a lot. We know what's right, and we get deceived. Why? Because maybe we question what we believe. We question. You see, and we're immersed in the Word of God. We're not going to question. We'll know when we hear false doctrine. We'll know when people's trying to deceive us and lead us away. It'll strike a nerve. We have to be convicted. So like we said, we need to be able to admit that I am the guilty one. And then we see that Cain also had a choice when he sinned. I mean, we need to keep it in the family here because he learned it from mom and dad. It was handed down to him. You know, we all know that Cain killed Abel because God accepted Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's. But I want you to pay close attention to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. I mean, God, speaking to Cain, he says, If you do what's right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right... Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. God knows that we have to learn how to master sin. We can't let sin be our master. Sin is a horrible master. Sin is a terrible master. How do we master sin? Well, we know we cannot conquer sin. We cannot conquer Satan on our own. We can only do that through the power of God. And so we have to understand what sin is. We need to learn to recognize what sin is. We need to learn to recognize temptation. You know, maybe there is something in your life, and I use maybe be courteous because I know we all struggle, and some of us struggle with a particular sin day in and day out. But see, we know what usually gets us in that situation where we're tempted. We have to learn how to avoid that, how to change that. So we need to learn to recognize sin and recognize the situations that put us in the sin and give it to God. Let Him take care of it. God is all-powerful and almighty. There's nothing He can't do. And when we give Him what we're struggling with, He is going to deal with it. He is going to take care of it. So after God talked to Cain, how did Cain do? How did he come out? I mean, he understood the fact that if he did right, he would be accepted. He understood that sin was crouching at his door. I mean, it's pretty hard to be surprised when you're in a room and somebody says, there's somebody on the other side of the door that wants to scare you. I'd like to think when you walked out, you wouldn't be scared. You were warned. God told Satan, or told, excuse me, Cain, Satan's waiting for you out there. 
And you need to do something about it. Genesis 4, 8. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Cain failed miserably. Sin was crouching at his door, and sin mastered him. So what made Cain kill Abel? Was Cain not aptly warned about allowing himself to be mastered by sin? Did Cain not understand what God meant when he said, sin is crouching at your door? You must master it. I mean, what drove Cain to kill his brother? I mean, Cain killed his brother. It wasn't for revenge. Abel did nothing to him. But it was because Cain made the choice. Cain refused to do what was right in the first place. One sacrifice was accepted. One was not. And again, we can get into all kinds of theological arguments about that, but the Bible makes it pretty clear that Abel gave of the first fruits of his flocks. He gave what God wanted. He gave the best. The Bible says Cain gave some. He gave some. And so the sacrifice of Cain was not acceptable. Was that Abel's fault? No, that was Cain's fault. He didn't do what was right in the first place. And since he didn't do what was right in the first place, it gave him motivation in his mind to do what was wrong in the second place. Well, if that's the way it's going to be, this is what I'm going to do. You know, Cain just could not master sin. Why? Because sin hardens our hearts. The more we sin, the more we allow sinful activity in our life, and even if we don't give in to the temptation, the more we allow sinful activity to influence, the harder our hearts become. Have you ever had to stop and think about your heart hardening. I mean, sometimes it's difficult to recognize because it's usually a gradual process. I mean, that's why Satan is easy to get Christians to sin because it's usually a gradual process. You know, you don't do the big things, you do the little things. And when you start doing a bunch of little things, the big things become easier. I mean, I remember several years ago, Tammy and I was standing in a Christian bookstore in Las Vegas yeah, I know that sounds ironic, but there was one there. And we was looking at Bibles. I was coming to the age where I needed a little bit larger print in my Bible. And I was looking and I was reading. And I looked up at her and I said, I think my heart is becoming hard. We have been through some things with the church and dealt with people, and I felt like I was losing my compassion. I felt like that I was beginning to think people just don't care. And the first thing that I realized I finally had to do was admit it to somebody. And I thought, if I can't admit it to my wife, I can't admit it to anybody. And I did feel a change at that point. I did feel a change. So sin does harden our heart. And what, what was the sin that was hardening my heart? It was the sin of lack of compassion, not loving, not caring. You know, but the more we sin, the easier it gets. When somebody does something wrong and they don't get caught, it gets easier the next time. I mean, you very rarely read about someone who, say, gets caught for embezzling that gets caught for embezzling a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars. It's always 400,000, a million. Why? Because it was easy in the beginning, and you got away with it. 
And then by the time maybe they realized, you know, I'm in too far over my head. And that's what sin does to us. And of course, as long as we always remember that we may be able to hide sins from our brothers and sisters, from people in the world, can't hide them from God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Nothing. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we give account. Now, I want you to think about that. How would you like to stand before a judge in a criminal law who already knows all the facts? He knows if you're lying or if you're not. He knows everything you already did. That's the way it is with God. He knows He knows our thoughts. He knows our motives. Nothing is hidden from Him, and He's the one to whom we must give account. So we need to uncover that sin to ourselves so our heart will not be hardened and we will be pleasing to God. But what we need to remember is that we have a choice. We have a choice. You know, now it's true that, that sin was introduced into the world by one man. But because of that introduction, we all still get to choose. We all still have a choice. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Therefore, just as sin entered into the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death came to all men because all sin. Why do we choose to sin? Because it brings us pleasure. Because there's something about that sin that's going to make us feel good for a moment. For a little while. I always say if sin was like a root canal, we could avoid it like crazy. I mean, if it's going to put us in that much pain, that much agony, it would be easy. But see, the fact is that it does, but just not when it's happening. It's always after the fact when you stop and realize, I made a bad decision. I made a bad choice. And for the Christian, that starts tearing your heart apart. You know, the story is told of a doctor who was teaching a group of medical students. And she pointed up to the x-ray and says, As you can see, the patient limps because his left tip fibula and tibula are radically arched. Then turning to one of the students, she asked, Michael, what would you do in a case like this? He sat there and he studied the x-ray and he looked for a moment and then he said, well, I suppose I would limp too. That's not what he wanted. How would you fix it? How would you fix it? See, and sometimes that's the way people get with sin. Instead of how can I fix it, I'll just keep limping along. I'll just do the same thing. You see, for the Christian especially, sin brings guilt. I mean, when you sin and you've done wrong, friends, you know it. The Spirit lets you know. The Spirit convicts you. You know, we want to hide our sin. We want to hold it in. But what it does, it starts eating us up from the inside. We think that every sermon, every lesson is right to us. He preached at me today. That lesson was all about me. And often we get defensive. And as I said, that's the spirit working in you. <clears throat> but you know, there's an old saying that goes, when you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that yelps is the one that got hit. And think about that. So, was the sermon at you? I'll tell you what, if you're yelping, probably was. Does that mean the preacher knows about your life and he's preaching at you? No, it means the Spirit is working in you. And friends, that's what we want. We want the Spirit to work in us, to change us. 
to help us understand that sin is wrong. Luke chapter 5 and verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knee and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. And of course, this is after Jesus had spoke to the crowds and Peter and his fishermen buddies had been out fishing all night. They come in and then Jesus asks to use their boat so he can speak. And so when he's done, he tells them to go back out. Go back out and catch some fish. Now, Peter is a commercial fisherman. This is what he does for a living. And he says, you know, we've been out all night. We've been out all night doing this. And they've just come in to clean their nets to get ready to do it the next night. And Jesus says, go back out now. This probably isn't the right time. But Peter says, because you say so, we'll do it. And they go out and they catch an amazing amount of fish. And when Peter sees this, he comes in and falls at the feet of Jesus. Why? He says, Lord, go away from me, for I am a sinful man. Peter's saying, I'm undeserving of what you just done for me. Friends, we're undeserving of what the Lord does for us every day. But he does it because he loves us. Loves us unconditionally. And it's hard. It's hard for us to understand that. You see, admission of guilt lifts a great burden off our shoulders and our hearts. You can ask anybody that's ever been struggling with sin in their life and then all of a sudden they, they admit it. They might just be admitting it to God. Maybe they need to admit it to a friend. Maybe they've responded to an invitation and admitted to the church. That burden of guilt is taken away. Paul wrote again in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaving no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. You see, when we continue to drag sin around with us, we get into that worldly sorrow. We get into that sorrow that leads to death. So what this really means is, if you've got sin in your life, and it's dragging you down, take responsibility for it. God, I am a sinner. God, I have sinned against you. Friends, we don't have to be perfect. We do not have to be perfect. David was far from perfect, yet he was a man after God's own heart. So we take responsibility for it. We have to learn to say, I am wrong. I chose to sin. Me and me alone. And now only I can take it to God. Only me and God can deal with it. Yes, my friends, as much as we hate to be wrong, we choose to sin. We do. We can also choose to rid ourselves by giving it to Jesus. We can rid ourselves of that sin merely by choosing. God created us with the ability to reason, the ability to choose, and we need to use that ability to make the right choices. Friends, I don't care how spiritual you are. I don't care how faithful you are. I don't care how long you've been in the church. You're going to still make some wrong choices. But the great thing is God is still there with his arms wide open saying, Come to me. Bring it to me. I will make it better. I will fix it. You may be dragging sin around with you. You don't have to. To borrow from the most interesting man in the world, I don't always sin. But when I do, I give it to Jesus. 
Friends, that's where we need to be. So if you're dealing with sin right now, if you're dealing with sin today, don't drag it out of here with you. Give it to God. Give it to Jesus. He'll take it. He wants it. He died on the cross for it already. He says, you don't have to carry it around. I've already bore that burden. If you've never been baptized for remission of sins, you're carrying sin around. We can take care of that. We can immerse you and you'll come out a brand new creation. You'll be forgiven of all sin. Christian, maybe you need forgiveness for something in your life. Maybe you need to talk to God personally about it. Do that. Maybe you want the prayers of the church. Seek out one of the elders. Come up front myself as we sing the invitation song and rid yourself of that burden of sin because it's your choice. Think about that as we stand and sing.